Thank you for listening to WQPA 89.3 FM, Shirley Fitchburg, Queen of Perpetual Help, and welcome to another edition of WQPH's Local Matters. On this week's broadcast, we return to WSFI, our sister stations, Reclamation Theology with Kyle Clement, and a special thanks to Angela Tomlinson, who is behind each episode. Recorded on the first Friday in September, Kyle Clement discusses conscience. This is part one of a two-part series. If you would like a copy of this broadcast, visit WSFICatholicRadio.org. And he must have a firm grasp of the unchanging message so that he can be counted on both for giving encouragement in sound doctrine and for refuting those who argue against it. WSFI 88.5 FM presents Reclamation Theology with Kyle Clement. Well, hello and welcome to this first Friday episode of Reclamation Theology. I'm your host, Angela Tomlinson, and our guest is Kyle Clement. For those of you who aren't familiar with Kyle, loyal to the Magisterium of the Roman Catholic Church, Clement has been involved in the curriculum, consultation, and formation of priests and laity relating to Catholic liberation and exorcism for over 15 years. A member of the Religious Association Societas Matris Dolorissime, he and Father Chad Ripperger have founded an organization known as Liber Cristo, where he provides instruction, evaluation, case investigation, consultation, and ongoing formation for bishops, exorcists, dioceses, and religious institutions in the United States and abroad, as well as establishing the materials and protocols for the same. So, Kyle, welcome again to this episode of Reclamation Theology. Thank you, Angela. It's good to be with you and your listeners this morning. Yes, and it's good to have you. I was listening closely to that quote, St. Paul to Titus, where he talks about the need to give instruction on sound doctrine and to, and to correct those who argue against it. And one of the topics we wanted to talk to you about today is the formation of a Catholic conscience and the need for sound doctrine. There seems to be a lot of confusion, Kyle, between there's one proponent called the seamless garment, which has been taken in a certain direction, and there's another group where the bishops voted that abortion is a preeminent evil and that it takes precedent over others. So something as fundamental as uh, forming a Catholic conscience right now is up for grabs. So I'm glad we have the show Reclamation Theology where we can get back to our roots of right and wrong. Well, thank you, Angela. I think that was the whole um, movement or the whole motivation to do the show was not to foster an agenda as much as to to speak for um, for our faith. And there is um, oftentimes the loudest argument is the weakest argument. And so we're seeing that played out now, especially in politics. And politics has become um, the epitome of that observation where the loudest argument is usually the weakest argument. And we struggle to live our faith. We don't know our faith. We lack the courage to live it and the courage to be the conscience of the culture. And we see this affect clergy as well as laity. We have a generation of, of malformed um, clergy and we have a gener- two generations of malformed laity. And so, in many ways, it's literally the blind leading the blind. What is our conscience? They talk about following our conscience, having your conscience prevail. What is our conscience? Well, I think that first and foremost is to understand that, and and I must make this statement, I am not formally trained in theology or in psychology. As Will Rogers would say, uh, all I know is, is what I've lived. And so, participating in exorcism, um, for several years, you you realize and you come to understand functional theology, meaning what is functional, what is speculative, because the demon will yield or he will not yield, and he will only yield to truth. And so I think that the, the first observation we have to make is relativism and modernism is what we live and what we think today, is it different than what the church taught for 19 centuries? the development of what the church taught based upon what our Lord taught. And so I think that's that's key. 
Now, the terminology, there's been a formalization of terminology with regard to theology and philosophy. And that, that's while that's a good thing, oftentimes it militates against direct understanding or the functional usage thereof. For instance, the soldier on the battlefield does not need to know the physics of ballistics to know that if he shoots, it'll have an effect, and if someone shoots at him, it'll have an effect. <laughs> and, and so I think that, that it's key for us to, to not divide along these lines, but to understand it. For the foot soldier, the war is a much different activity than it is for the general. Um, and, and so the war is different for the laity than it is for the properly formed clergy, and, and for sure for the malformed clergy. So all that having been said, your question was, what is conscience? And so let's look at it from a couple of different ways, and, and what I'll give you will not be the formal definition, philosophy definition of conscience. I'll give you the functional definition of conscience. Conscience is that which is in us that tells us right from wrong, clean from unclean, good from bad. It is that function that turns us toward God or away from God. That is our conscience. So you'll hear prick of conscience. And so functionally what happens is we sin, we have a prick of conscience, we have a realization, especially in the examination, uh, in the daily examine, is we say, okay, here is where my conscience is eroding, my, my instrument by which I tell if I'm right in right relationship with God. And that's another way we can look at it is it's an instrument and it constantly needs calibrating. How do you calibrate an instrument? By exposing it to something that is true. For instance, if I'm going to calibrate a scale then I have a weight that I know precisely that it weighs one ounce or one pound or whatever that is. I'll place that weight on the scale to be calibrated and then the scale will tell me what the scale thinks it weighs. And if it's off, then I have to adjust the scale. This is a very key concept because the way we calibrated our conscience for centuries was through the three legs, the three supports, the three pillars of Catholicism, and they were tradition, magisterium, and scripture. And all three of those have been under vehement attack and, and deformation. So it's difficult to calibrate our conscience, our instrument, modernly. We're not getting this weekly calibration in confession. We're not getting this weekly calibration in homily. We're not getting this weekly calibration whereby our intellect is constantly tuned toward God. And so I'd like to discuss that concept just a little bit because it, that is a key is that we are actually deforming our instrument, our conscience, when we are developing opinion and we're, we're engaging in secular discourse, especially on politics, to the neglect of our readings of, of Holy Scripture, our readings of the saints, our listening to right doctrine and homilies that reflect right doctrine and tradition. And the phraseology, we've lost it. Words have lost their meaning. We participate in activities which deform our conscience, which deform our properly formed Catholic conscience. Can you kill your conscience? You can severely wound it. You can't kill it because you are a creature and you have a relationship with Creator, whether you want it or not. You can render your conscience more abound. You can greatly uh, wound it. You can render it in almost inoperative. But there is no conscience beyond being pricked, which is the realization that I have sinned against you and against God. And ultimately, this is the, the prodigal's realization in the pig pen, is the pricking of conscience. And the phrase in the, in the scriptures is, and he came to his senses. And so at some point, didn't, it doesn't matter how, how deep the life of depravity is, and we see this in practicing Satanists, it's, and it's interesting. There, there's, there's something they won't do, or that they realize this is so deviant, and and then they, uh, 
that prick of conscience awakens them to the fog that they're in and they realize I have come so far and I've fallen into such a depth of depravity that I've, I've ruined my relationship or I've damaged my relationship with God. And then there's the Psalm 130, the profundest response to that, which is out of the depths I cry to you, O Lord. And this is the primordial cry, the, the, the cry of creature to creator, and God hears that. So it doesn't matter how deep we've fallen into depravity. The prick of conscience, none of us are beyond that. And so it's a good question that you ask because it gives you an indication of prayer, and that is just that awake, O sleeper, all of us who have uh, breath, all of us who are creature, that we would, something would happen that would draw us to look up toward Creator, that we would we would leave that ad hominem posture and, and be ad orientum, that focused on God, even if it's just in that moment. Because this is the beginning of conversion, is this realization that we've, we've damaged relationship with God and that there is in fact a God. Um, I think that that's something that we miss, is we often pray wanting to affect behavior, uh, not conversion. And that opens up a whole other topic. But uh, speaking to that, can one kill one's conscience? You can severely impair it, you can render it more abound, but you cannot kill it. What, what are the symptoms? that someone exhibits when their conscience has been deeply wounded? The two primary symptoms that we see is self-justification for behavior they know to be sinful or contrary to the faith. That's number one. Number two is a desire to preserve or to affect or erect reputation meaning and in this moment one seeks the affirmation of one's peers or other creatures to the neglect of the uh, relationship with creator so those are your two main landmarks and i think they're very sobering and we realize that in many places our instrument is in fact um, damaged in the prayers of the auxilium christianorum today is the prayer of humility the litany of humility very very good um, it falls on Friday when we commemorate on every Friday the passion of our Lord. But our properly formed conscience helps direct our thoughts to our Lord, our Lady, uh, to our faith. And so those thoughts are never far away from the properly formed conscience. Um, the litany of humility helps fine tune that conscience on a Friday. And it speaks to both things that I'm talking about. One is self justification, and the other one is the desire. Uh, for reputation or self-image where we're looking for the esteem of others or the esteem of ourselves, our self-esteem, rather than to be pleasing to God. And I think that's a key point is that um, there are many, many good people, people who do good, but they're more concerned with how their fellow man thinks about them, their peers think about them, than they are how God thinks about them. And they're more concerned with it's being self-justified in their actions, and so they become the focal point. So how do you see that, say, playing out in today's world? Are there, are there practical examples that come to mind, Kyle, of those two things? Say, we're turning on the TV. What are we looking at that is a living, breathing example of those two issues of a deadening of conscience? Okay, Angela, you ask a very important question, a very poignant question. And so I'm going to repeat it to be sure I understand it. When we turn on the television, what are we looking at that kills our conscience? Is that what you're asking? Yes, or as an example of killing, an example of people on the television that have wounded their conscience, and so and their actions are kind of it's kind of like you go to a doctor's office. Where does it hurt? And they say, oh, "My heart hurts." When you look at the symptoms of a conscience that's been deadened. Okay, what behavior so, do you see that is symptomatic of people on television or on the news? All right, so what I'm going to say is going to sting. Um, you'll get that warning from me periodically. <laughs> okay. But your question, and, and let me rephrase it, your question is, when we turn on the television, what are we looking at that wounds our conscience or that further debilitates our conscience? Is that accurate? Yes. What we're looking at is our own reflection reflected back in the TV screen. If you're watching television, 
you're wounding your conscience. Very simply. What if you're watching EWTN? You're wounding your conscience. Why is that, Kyle? You're wounding your conscience because you're stepping out of the participatory role and you're now in a spectator role. We are the church militant. We're not the church observant. We're not the church hanging out. We're not the church reticent. We're the church militant. And often when you're watching someone pray, you're not praying. When we're listening to a recorded rosary, we're not praying. There, there has to be that active participation. And so while watching EWTN is better than watching something else, there's not the merit involved as if one were doing their own prayer, they were participating in an active life of their own faith. When we watch that, when anytime we're watching television, um, we're, we're living vicariously, we're living virtually, we're not truly living. And, and like I said, this is going to sting because a lot of us do these activities um, that bring us a certain emotional consolation, but they're not helping us order our life to an active and vibrant practice of the faith. Well, what if you're watching, you know, you want to see what's going on in the world and what happened today and what people's positions are on different issues. None of that, Kyle, you would say is appropriate? All of that, I mean, none of that brings you a, will bring you a spiritual consolation. Do you want to be a saint? Me? Yes, of course. We all say that. But these are the activities of those who wish to be saints is, is that it's a, it has to be focused on our Lord. We're either focused on God or we're not. And so, again, it's a very militant stance. We are powerless to affect politics by watching them daily. If we vote, if we understand the issues as should be told to us cleanly um, and should be explained to us cleanly by those more knowledgeable than us, but we're missing that voice. We're missing, we're missing from um, our leaders, our clerics and our lay leaders, the clear vision of what it is to be Catholic because every one of those visions is, is they take it, they polish it, they give you a different aspect of it. And so it, it's difficult to find that, that pure voice that is telling you this is, this is how to be Catholic. This is how to be militantly Catholic. Getting back to the idea of conscience, Kyle, if someone wanted to check to see if their conscience is in right order, what steps would they take? You mentioned three that you look at, which was tradition, magisterium, and scripture. So be, assume we're beginning at the beginning saying, is my conscience calibrated? Okay. From a traditional standpoint, I think that you look, um, look at uh, moral theology. Am I ethical? Do I have integrity? Does my, is my faith reflected in my daily actions? Or am I making... Um, negotiations or capitulations or am I acquiescing in certain areas for a job for a friendship for this for that or there is there any places what's the low spot in my wall of virtue do I practice virtue equally to all creatures do do I extend charity Christian charity love of God manifest as love of neighbor do I do that to all Am I perfect as the Heavenly Father is perfect? Perfect meaning is, is consistent. Am I, do I love all? And so there's a lot of work to be done in our, in our own sovereignty, in our own fortress, if you will, before we go to espousing, uh, espousing ideas or where some, someone should, uh, should change. And, and all I'm saying is I'm, I'm the greatest among sinners. I'm not, I'm not saying that I'm, I'm looking past the beam in my eye at, at, at when I'm speaking here is, is the, the first element to formation of conscience has to start with our own interior before we can expose the conscience to the world. It has to be properly calibrated in a safe environment. That safe environment is the prayer of your home, good spiritual direction from someone who understands that we have to constantly work in and around the area of virtue. And so, what is the traditional view of virtue? 
what is the traditional view of the relationship between the spiritual works of mercy and the corporal works of mercy? What is the traditional view on the important things, the things that have eternal consequence and their primacy over created things, even the earth, even um, other other things? There is a wonderful prayer in circulation out there. Um, I've been handing out these prayer cards. It's a prayer to Our Lady, exterminatrix of all heresy. Wow. I think it's very, very important for us to be praying these this prayer. Um, I don't have a card right at hand, but it's to Our Lady, exterminatrix of all uh, heresies. I ordered this card from the Bond family. I don't know if you're familiar with Pete Bond and his family, which make prayer cards, but you'll be able to Google it and find it there. But essentially it talks about the clear understanding of what is important, what is not important, and the heresies and, and errors of our age, uh, which is the elevation of created things and creatures over the Creator. So that's first of all, is the, is the tr what is the traditional look at this? And uh, then what is the scriptural overlay where it mentions this, where we found that in history, in scriptural history, when Israel and when Christianity became um, ad hominem or focused away from God, this is when their relationship with God suffered. The sin cycle of the Old Testament was largely when Israel was trying to be like its neighbors. They wanted a king. They wanted certain things. They wanted to be Hellenized. So when any time Israel engaged in politics, it did not go well. Catholicism is what Judaism looks like if you believe that Jesus was the Messiah. This is the continuation of God's chosen people. God chose the Israelites. We as Gentiles choose God. And then through the adoption process are joined to him. But we're still supposed to be his manifestation, his people, a people who live according to those tenets and teachings that reflect God to the rest of humanity. Ultimately, that's what it is to be Catholic. Are you reflecting the values that our Lord preached, that he talked about, that he taught us, the integrity of creation, the integrity of the human person? Are we a living example of that? Ultimately, this is God's manifestation when his love becomes manifest in humanity in choosing Israel is this this chosen people, this model model people. When they were in right relationship with God, when they were acting as God's people, and they had an interior disposition, they were unassailable. They were they were um, unconquerable. But they give that high ground away in the same way that we're giving it away. There were things that were incompatible with being an Israeli. There were things that were incompatible with being one of God's chosen people. There are things that are incompatible with being a Catholic. There are political things. There are all kinds of things that are simply incompatible and cannot be reconciled with Catholicism. Kyle, I have, I have one for you. Okay. I was just listening to Scott Hahn, who did like a 60-second spot, and he was talking about being accountable. Not only are we accountable for every word that we say, but we're also accountable for every silence. And I think, you know, in today's world, what do you think about one of the things being incompatible with being a Catholic as silence? Silence in view of what's going on and what we're being taught and told and directed to do. Well, while he brings up an interesting point, I think you have to look at it in a traditional sense, and that is, do you have a, a duty and an obligation? If so, to whom do you have the duty and to whom do you have the obligation? And so I think that oftentimes we, this becomes um, corrupted, if you will, or twisted when our first and primary obligation is to the souls that our Lord has placed in our care providentially and through vocation. So listen to this language very carefully. So the first obligation is to the souls that our Lord has put in our care providentially. Which would be whom, Kyle? What souls has the Lord put in our care? My wife and my children. Your wife and your children. It's a bishop. It is your flock. It is your flock within the geographical boundaries of your episcopate. If you're a priest, it is your flock. 
it is the souls within the geographical boundaries of your parish. And so what happens is we go off on these false crusades, leaving our homelands to be picked over by the enemy while we're fighting a fight that is not our fight. We are first and foremost responsible and will give answer to the souls that were in our care. We see this wreckage, this carnage in all kinds of people who work ministries and their own families are a wreck. We're, we're leaving our homes and fighting a war that is not our fight to the neglect of those souls which are directly in our care. And so while we have an obligation to speak, that obligation is first and foremost manifest in those souls which God has placed in our care, our wife, our children, those over whom um, we have a direct influence. And so to fling your voice out into the void, the railings against a political machine that is diabolically inspired, this is a wasting of, of your voice. This is a wasting of your vitality if you're not first discharging this duty totally in your own family. This is Paul's exhortation to Timothy on deacons and bishops and who they should be. So the right ordered family is a manifestation of the, of the right ordered household. I think this is so important we skip over it because the focus becomes on what do I wanna do rather than what is my duty and obligation to those souls that God has placed in my care. That was wonderful. How could we close with the prayer please? Certainly, in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Lord God Almighty, ancient of days, you who bring cosmos out of chaos and order out of disorder, we ask you especially as we approach the nativity of your blessed mother to be mindful everywhere and always of her docility, her willingness to do your will, her desire to do what you want because you want it, her desire to be formed by you may we ask her intercession for ourselves for our clergy for our leaders blessed mother be present to our conscience may we be always and everywhere mindful and as saint maximilian kobe said let us say nothing or think nothing we would not have the blessed mother sign her name to lord we thank you for life we thank you for this opportunity to live in these times which you have deigned Give us the courage and strength to speak the truth, to live the truth, and to be the truth. In Christ's most holy and precious name, amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Tune in next week for the conclusion of this series. You have been listening to WSFI 88.5 FM, Reclamation Theology. A copy of this broadcast will be made available at wsficatholicradio.org. Thank you for listening to another edition of WQPH's Local Matters. We hope you enjoyed the broadcast and hope you have a blessed week.